Good morning and welcome. My name is Carol Carter from Global Minded, and we are delighted today to be uh, working with the World Academy of Art and Science and the UN office in Geneva on the whole Global 21 Leaders event. And Pavel Luksha is co-facilitating this panel with me. We're delighted to have you here joining us. And today's topic is on education, employment, entrepreneurship, and equity. Our panelists will be reviewing the many issues of the last six to eight months that have happened that are COVID-19 related, have to do with racial and um, other types of inequities and general, general situations that have persisted over time before these crises hit and impacted health, employment, and a lot of other social injustices that have persisted. So we're delighted that you've joined us today and we've got a number of incredible leaders. And uh, Pavel just would like to introduce you to say a few words and then I will introduce our first speaker. Hello everyone, it's uh, excited, exciting to be here. Uh, I look forward to the panel. I think we are dealing indeed on one hand with immediate situations. The situation of coronavirus has accelerated a lot of transformation that have been discussed for a very long time, uh, such as a massive anticipation of the transformation of economy due to automation, bringing up new technologies and changing skills. But also it highlights uh, the need for a different relationship, working relationship, professional relationship, and general society, societal relationship, more need for community building, more need for empowerment uh, of people that have been evidently hit by a crisis like this, will be hit by more crises that we anticipate in the future. So recognition of equity, social justice will be extremely important in the next decade. And we need to uh, build our systems to be more resilient and more acknowledging this problem. So I look forward to the panel. Absolutely, and one of the reasons that we're all partnering is we know that no one organization or not even a couple of organizations can bring the diversity of thought, the diversity of race, of class, of all different ways you can define diversity to the leadership table. And that to get real systems change, which is needed in the world at this time, we need that type of diversity. So um, Gary Jacobs, who runs World Academy of Art and Science, um, has been very clear that we can't do it with all the people we're used to working with. We really have to work and cross-pollinate with what a global-minded we call uncommon collaborators. So we're delighted that you're joining us on that journey. And we will also, for your colleagues and people who couldn't make it live today, we will have this posted on the Global Minded uh, 2020 YouTube channel, and I believe on the WAS channel as well. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, one of our first panelists today. And um, this is Dr. Kevin Brown, and he's the president of Scorpion Inc. and chief technology officer of the Great Ball of Light company. Uh, he is someone who has over 30 years of experience in corporate and government service doing innovative research, building team systems, doing systems development, and worldwide operations. He's an inventor who also brings senior level leadership, entrepreneurship, and hands-on experience in developing and delivering breakthrough technologies, products, and operational capabilities. He earned a PhD developing finite sequences for communications at the University of Leeds in the United Kingdom. Kevin has led numerous ventures from space navigation to developing new energy storage materials. He is known to move adeptly across disciplines and from abstract to practical in search of advocates and solutions. He's also known never to be a stranger to a great idea. So I think Kevin and all of the people represented here represent that type of innovative and curious spirit. And that's a type of real genuine collaboration that we need to move the major levers of access and equity. Kevin, welcome. And uh, Pavel and I are so delighted that you are here with this esteemed panel. Yes, yes, thank you, Carol. Thank you uh, to Global Minded and the World Academy of Arts and uh, Science. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, it's an honor to be with uh, uh, a panel that's bringing exciting leadership uh, and expertise to drive equality uh, for a world that we would like to see. Uh, the topic of the session uh, is an important one in my mind. 
uh, thank you, Pavel, for transforming it, um, for framing it, uh, and adding clarity and emphasis. So this is a uh, very important. Uh, for me, the challenge of providing mechanisms of change, uh, equity mechanisms that uh, uh, support education uh, for employment and entrepreneurship, uh, we, we have to frame the backdrop. And uh, that is to be effective in thinking outside of the box uh, to support change, uh, we must uh, at least know where the box is, right? So as Pavel states, uh, actions and outcomes in the United States have an impact on the rest of the world. So I'd like to highlight just a sprinkling of facts, uh, outcomes. So let's get reality out of the way. So inequality, we know what the wealth gap means in the United States. Uh, about $171,000 is the net wealth of a typical white family. Um, a typical black family is about, has about 10 times less wealth, about $17,000 in 2006. Education, blacks and Latino women uh, are about five times less likely to get their first degree uh, in engineering as compared to white males. Uh, funding for entrepreneurs, uh, founding startups, white, uh, black, whatever, women entrepreneurs, uh, they receive about 3% of the total dollar capital uh, value invested in 2019. And, and, and that was uh, as high as it had ever been. Um, funding for, uh, for um, black founders um, is at just 1% um, uh, last year. So voila, we, we've got state values, right? We, we have a sense of where we are today. But what we know is that uh, these outcomes are, 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 are not independent, right? Uh, to address one means to address uh, them all in some way. And in relative terms, uh, it's true everywhere in the world. Uh, and, and I claim that these outcomes are unsustainable in any modern society. So for those of you who are watching, um, uh, being born in the 1960s uh, may mean a long time ago. I was born in the 1960s, uh, but, to, but, to, but to, to move forward, we really have to understand that uh, my upbringing um, is on the same continuum uh, that we see punctuated today by images of violence perpetrated on peoples of color and the marches that, uh, that pierce the conscience of people all over the world. Uh, in the moments of, of my, my youth, we already had family members, uncles and aunts who had been murdered for promoting the right to vote, uh, chased or killed by a clan for looking the wrong way or loving the wrong person. But even in this, uh, hope was not dismissed. It could not be dismissed. And people of conscience um, saw me and others uh, me, a little black boy, uh, I, I was to be loved and, and respected. Uh, I was to be able to hold hands and learn with white children who were bust, that, that bust into my neighborhood, into my schools, uh, so that uh, we could uh, learn, learn together. Um, and, and these were kids from the wealthier side of the railroad track, as it were. So even people who maybe lack the mind, a, a sense of where, where the world really, really was at the time, who said uh, maybe the dreams of Kevin for to be a scientist or an engineer is, uh, is out of reach, um, is something that Kevin shouldn't do or, or people of my kind shouldn't do. Uh, hope secured the path for me. Uh, hope brings determination uh, from expectation and it, uh, it propelled me. It propelled me uh, so that the education of life, the education afforded in academia, uh, would provide opportunities well beyond my dreams as a little boy. Uh, I, I could study abroad with international renowned scientists. Uh, I could uh, do innovative tasks and, and, and of my own dreaming with teams that I built. I could run businesses uh, with the potential of worldwide impact. Uh, so my path to great ball of light and even Scorpion uh, is my long road, but it's just one point of surety for all of those who are on this continuum. So despite the stubborn uh, outcomes of inequity, uh, I'm hopeful and I am expecting for you and for all of us uh, that good will be done and we will be able to move forward. Uh, certainly those that stood up in my life um, have made a difference. Uh, the fact that we now have 138 institutions in the United States, higher learning institutions, where black, uh, graduating black engineers 
um, are, are graduating at the same rates or higher than white graduates. Um, that, is, that was huge for me to understand. And we, we understand now that the work done by private educational foundations, some of which the panel members are, are involved with across the spectrum, um, from primary to post-secondary, uh, in and out of schools, right, have lifted children, have lifted families, and are in their lives. And so for this reason, I, I have come to expect that uh, we will be able to make changes. We will be able to do things that we've never been able to do before. And this is bolstered by what I've seen recently. And so touches my heart, uh, the, the consciousness of so many in this country and around the world uh, are not just acting uh, through the disadvantaged or, or oppressed, but the action for the first time in my life now demonstrably are coming from peoples of all walks, of all types, and from everywhere, uh, everywhere, to, to show that we need to move forward. We need to do things differently. And so I believe that we must continue this long fight, uh, long fight to love one another, and we must prevail. And I am hopeful. I say I'm hopeful, and the future is going to be built, built on all of us. Carol? And let's make that so. And that is why we are here. And I, I think, Kevin, you know, you're such a great role model. And we met through your business partner, Ron McNeil, who's another great role model. And you all have an incredible circle of people who have been your mentors, but also who you've been able to mentor. And that's a powerful circle, I think, for, for all of us to connect with, to, to have the change that you describe happen. So looking forward to more and uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, Jennifer Bonine and we met each other in Davos last year at the World Economic Forum a place where we didn't see a lot of women or people of color and uh, that's a place where way more diversity um, needs to be in order for the change that Kevin just spoke of. Jennifer is one of our uh, big partners and she's gonna tell you about her work she's a pioneering woman in technology and um, one of the only if not the only uh, female running an artificial intelligence company. So Jennifer, welcome, and we're so glad that you could join us. Thank you so much, Carol, and thank you, Pavel, both for um, hosting all of us. This is such a great forum, and I'm honored to be here with all of my fellow pan panelists today. Um, we all know, as um, Pavel mentioned it in the beginning, that AI is accelerating. There was an article just out this morning um, that talked about the acceleration of AI now due to COVID-19 and companies' desire to start leveraging AI for more of the critical functions in our world. With that being said, we know this was the fourth industrial revolution. AI will permeate all of our lives at some point. We believe that there is a critical need at this point to introduce AI and machine learning in the classrooms as early as elementary school. We want to create an understanding of AI that will be part of our new global reality for the children as they're growing up. My belief and our belief at Pink Lion is that we want inclusive, human-centered AI platforms that are developed and deployed to ensure our jobs in America and across the world are not just devastated by the rapid growth of AI, but actually enhanced dramatically through the use and partnership of AI technologies. To the point that I believe youth um, can handle and should be being taught um, more about artificial intelligence and how it impacts their world, we know that textbooks introducing first graders to AI are already part of China's early childhood curriculum. We've started crafting a series of books here in the United States to teach children ages four to seven about the power of AI and machine learning and believe it's imperative that all of us in corporate America and education um, in venture capitalist um, focus on capabilities and assisting in educating our youth and involving them in the developing development, deployment, and building of AI solutions. As part of the bold goal that Carol mentioned, what we also want to do to meet that goal is to leverage AI and parse through data precisely to help us find and match students with mentors, jobs, and opportunities. Machine learning algorithms can do a lot of heavy lifting that humans are unable to perform on their own at speed and scale, helping us get to this bold goal much faster. 
We are presently building algorithms in partnership with a group called Intelligent Voices of Wisdom, or IVAL. It's an AI and stor storytelling startup that focuses on cultural intelligence and social impact. And again, because we focus on ensuring and educating youth as well, we believe that people at, as early as age four will become comfortable with AI, will help build and drive their world, that the students will take part in the design development and implementation of these comprehensive AI platforms, that by doing all of this, we will be able to succeed in what we're trying to achieve here with those 25 million youth getting to be connected to their mentors, their jobs, and their opportunities at this critical time. There was a huge impact during COVID-19 to a lot of students coming out of their education into the workforce. We want to ensure that those students have the opportunities they need. We want to ensure that they're building companies of the future. And then lastly, we're partnering to work with venture capital firms to reimagine what inclusive startup funding looks like. Um, as Dr. Brown mentioned, there is an inequity in funding right now. And if we are not funding these diverse corporations, if we are not funding efforts like our bold goal at Global Minded, we won't have the inclusivity we need in the companies that are being built and developed in the world right now. So we want to reimagine what inclusive startup funding looks like, providing additional opportunities and financing in all communities across the globe. Thank you, Jennifer. And the reason it's so powerful what Jennifer is describing is because to connect 25 million first-gen students, first-gen graduates, and those who work with them and those who want to hire them, those are the kinds of people who have been most disproportionately impacted by COVID, by job loss, by colleges, a lot of them, um, some of the historically black colleges, minority-serving institutions. Um, but also we realize this is influencing people around the world whose education is being interrupted because of COVID and job loss and other kinds of things that are happening as a result. So this is a powerful um, intervention and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in the next round, but um, definitely has intervention at scale to, to solve the global issues. And now- Can I, so can I, ask, can, can I ask Jennifer a very quick question? Yes. Um, I was wondering, as you are building up this this culture of inclusivity in your startup and and um, an inclusive startup in terms of employment opportunities, what are the main challenges that you face in your work? Yeah, one of one of the challenges we do face is um, traditional mindset. So there's two schools of thought in the world right now around AI. There's actually a very popular book. Um, that was about um, the race um, to the new world order, AI superpowers, the race to the new world order, which some of you may have seen. Um, it's, it can be a little scary, right? There's two schools of thought. One is you race to the dollar. You do whatever it takes um, to leverage AI to become so critical in companies and corporations that they pay mass amounts of money to the, the builders and creators of those solutions. And then there's what we're trying to do, which is um, inclusive humanized AI, which doesn't replace the humans, it augments humans. And that's really the, the moral dilemma we're all facing right now um, across the globe of as humans backing and supporting those organizations that have a human-centered AI vision that want the future of work to be inclusive. So instead of taking out a lot of jobs and purely just eliminating jobs initially that were primarily done by um, uh, minorities, low-income folks, those jobs being the first that AI could potentially just remove, we want to look at a world where we augment humans' capabilities, we retrain and retool people to be ready for the future of work, and we bring them along this journey, hence why we start with the youth right now. So they're growing up learning how to use these technologies, they have access to it, and it's not purely access based on your zip code or the education level of the generations before you or your parents, but everyone has access to it. Thank you, Pavel. That was a great question. And Jennifer and I and the team that we're a part of, which is an integrated cross-disciplinary cross team, realized that these issues we're talking about in this panel are systemic. That means it's not just in business. It's not just in technology. It's not just in higher ed. It's not just in government. So if you don't have a strategy with each of those different 
groups, you can't get the change that's needed. And our next uh, panelist is a tremendous person representing a lot of young people. She's first generation to college um, and she's um, done an incredible job as an entrepreneur herself with Darte Design. But she's also very connected to people at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, and we're very hopeful that MIT will be our partner on achieving this bold goal, because we know full well that we can't do it without a strong university partner, and that universities have also been, you know, bastions of places where not everybody has been able to equally succeed. And so um, we think there's such an opportunity to bring our community to a place like that. And Jessica has really stepped up as our leader. We've got other wonderful people in the global minded community who um, also are alums of MIT who are helping us. But Jessica has really been there as the as the as the leader in the charge. So. Jessica Artiles, welcome, and so glad that you're here, and she's uh, just a delight. So tell us about yourself, your work, your path, so that the listeners have a little bit greater sense of what really young, incredible science leadership looks like. That's so kind of you, Carol. Thank you for the, for the super kind introduction. Um, again, hi, everyone. My name is Jessica Artiles, and I am so happy, also honored, to be here. I probably am the youngest on the panel, maybe not by much. Um, and, and I'm just grateful to be in the space. You know, a while, I think around last week, I got really tired of webinars and I swore that I wouldn't sit on any other webinar until it was face-to-face -face interaction. And then last night I got to thinking um, with Carol's, you know, kind uh, invitation to serve on the panel, I got to thinking, how can we really uh, shake things up? in this world, sort of follow Carol's charge, right? The charge and the initiative of, of the global leadership. So um, I, I, I guess all I say all of this to say that I'm taking every opportunity as a designer, as, a, as an engineer, as an artist, as a human, I'm taking all opportunities in this crazy weird world to experiment with things right now um, because the world is a little crazy, but it also, it also is close to a reset button. It's almost like we press pause and we have the opportunity to reset. Now, if we have this opportunity and we keep looking at things under the same frameworks as before, then what's gonna emerge is probably the same version, some other version of the same thing as before. And instead, um, I think the idea here is to move forward with a brand new lens. For me, um, this lens has been designed. So I try to see the connection about how things work in the world through design. Um, I started, so a little bit about my background, I was born in Cuba. I even, one of the things I'm experimenting with is, so what is the benefit of being able to be so close up to your panelists, like you can't get on a regular stage? So now is a teachable moment, Cuba, communism, red star in the middle, Puerto Rico is the inverse. Puerto Rico is the blue star, blue, freedom, I don't know, whatever you want. <laughs> but now you know red versus blue. <laughs> Or Cuban versus Puerto Rican flag, which I'm sure you've all, you know, <laughs> been anxious about in the past. So I'm, I'm leaning into these small moments because, um, you know, in my journey, I came, uh, well, I escaped as a baby, thank God, from Cuba, then we escaped from Peru, then I escaped from Miami, and finally now I'm at MIT. Um, so welcome all to this wonderful campus, this wonderful playground. And what MIT taught me that I would love for our listeners to, to really take home with themselves today is that um, is the following. I worked at the admissions office for four years and whenever I would get asked, how do I get into MIT? How can I help you know, my application get me in? I would remind them that our model at the admissions office was that it didn't matter to us how much you had done or how far you had gone or what you knew or had accomplished even. It mattered to us what you had done given the cards you were dealt, given the situation that you were put in, what was your so what? What did you do about it? Maybe it looks grandiose and maybe it looks small and personal and intense and, and, and focused. It doesn't matter what it looks like. The point is what was that delta, right? What was that difference that you were able to make given the cards that you were dealt? And honestly, you guys, I think this is the best panel. You know, thank you, Carol, again, for bringing us all together because I think this is how our ideas and concepts bring clarity to ourselves and to others, perhaps, which is um, there's so much going on right now. 
do not be fooled that because you that some one thing has been taken away from you that any future opportunity has been taken away from you on the contrary for every setback that we have is another opportunity to increase that delta right to start from before and get to even farther so i think that's it for now <laughs> That's why I say, imagine this bold goal delivering 25 million uh, people like Kevin and Jennifer and Jessica. And that's what we're creating. So that's exciting. Thank you so much, Jessica. And now uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Carol Spaulding. She's the president of Rowan Cabarrus Community College in North Carolina. And she has a lot of um, background in this whole field and can help us really frame the education piece, the employment piece, the entrepreneurship piece from one of our most critical opportunities really around the world is where can students go for skills and knowledge that doesn't cost a fortune and that's one of the big equity divides. Welcome uh, Carol, Pavel and I are so delighted to have you here. Oh, you know what? I don't think we have your audio yet, Carol. We just got to un unmute oh, that's, you. That was operator error. Sorry. Okay. No worries. <laughs> Welcome. I just wanted to thank you for uh, letting me come and being a part of this esteemed panel. I'm very excited to hear all the things I've already heard. Um, but I also want to use this opportunity to let people know what uh, public higher education, especially community college mission is and how it fits with the goals that we're trying to achieve, though we're not there yet. And uh, I'll save my COVID uh, conversations for later. I'm going to make a huge risk here and try and share a screen. Um, and I'm not sure if the, uh, yeah, really, thank you, Jessica. Um, I'm not sure that uh, the, the administrators can do it or if I need to do it. Since I'm the we'll first one, I thought for sure the rest of you would have something like, you know, was really wild and crazy. Okay, so I'm going to try it. No um, worries. If it, well, let's see. Okay. Um, <laughs> what's, the, what's the David Edinburgh voice in the background narrating? This is a human in the wild trying to share a screen in the 21st century. We don't know what's going to happen next. <laughs> That's really true. And, uh, you know, I'm wondering about it right now. So it's not taking, I don't think. It, it, yeah. If it doesn't, no worries. Okay. So it's not. Okay. So we were just, even though I practiced today and drove my entire staff crazy, um, but I, you know, we'll, we will get to it. Um, so I didn't ant anticipate being a, an educator. I wanted, I have an international studies degree and expected to be in the State Department or doing something wonderful on world peace. So here I am finally doing something on world peace. Thank you very much. Um, and I wanna talk about the thousand community colleges of both their public, tribal and independent serving 11 million students in the United States. And of that group, um, 41% of all undergraduates are in community colleges. And every state in the United States has a different configuration. Some community colleges belong to universities. It's all over the place. So it's still an evolving, flexible uh, educational process that welcomes everybody with an open door. And so we have always been very proud of our ability to attract and retain students of all types. And so we have 57% of all Native Americans, 52% of all Hispanics, 42% of all Blacks, and 39% of Asian and Pacific Islanders in the undergraduate world of community colleges rather than in another setting. In our roles to serve women, we've, we've achieved a 57% goal there. Um, my particular school is 61% women. Um, but in the whole composite of the undergraduate education, um, really community colleges uh, only enroll. Um, so the first thing I gave you was a percent of all Native Americans. So I'm going to say that of our population in community colleges, only 1% of our population is Native American. Only 26% of our population is Hispanic. 13% is Black. 6% is Pacific Islander. 45% is white, and then 10% other. 
So we have a good represent, representation. We have the bulk of, I think, where we were able to bring in first time in college. Uh, many of our students transfer to universities throughout the country, but mostly to the University of North Carolina system. Uh, that system is not as robust as we'd like it to be. Um, we have a mission that takes everything from English as a second language to all the way through transfers of engineering degrees and the like. Um, so we are very much uh, a part of our communities in North Carolina where there are 58 of us and they're all different. So the differences I think give us some strengths and some weaknesses. Uh, in my area, we have, um, just to go back to sort of the, the setting of the day, uh, COVID has hit North Carolina in a big way. As you might know, um, the, the uh, Republican convention is supposed to be held in Charlotte. It probably is only going to have a very minor piece of that. Um, and that's because our governor's holding the line on how we are to behave in public. Um, it's that got that... Um, convention is going to Jacksonville, where I spent 30 years in community college work, and they're going to run it wide open, which is, does not surprise me, um, because that state has a whole different philosophy um, on uh, COVID than I think a lot of people do, and I've got a lot of family and friends down there, so I got my fingers crossed. Um, but in any case, uh, we are substantially uh, online, almost completely online. I can go back into that, uh, as you know, um, and we we, our students have made the transition. I think the big news in this is that the federal government is giving universities and community colleges and school systems federal money for the first time in record time. We applied for uh, our, our part, which was formula, $2.8 million, which is a lot of money to us. We have, um, and we got it on a Saturday night. So we got the first half and then they said, you have to spend the first half before you get the second half. We applied for the second half, we got that in a week. So things were changing, I mean, in record time. So to go back to this point about we are at an inflection point, no, I think we're at a real pivot. Um, even the Department of Defense that doesn't let veterans take courses online um, and, and receive their veterans benefits changed their policy between now and December. And they did that before anybody did anything else. I've never seen anything with speed and I've, you know, I mean, I've been a president for 11 years here and also in Jacksonville, Florida, nothing has moved like COVID has moved us. We are 10 years ahead of where we would be if we hadn't had COVID to make us more accessible. So uh, I think I'll stop there uh, and be glad to go into any depth in any of those areas, but uh, just really appreciate your time. Thank you. That's great, Carol. I just want to ask you a quick follow-up, which is you are a pioneering woman as a president of a university, and there aren't very many uh, presidents of universities, and there's about 17% people of color who are presidents of universities. So just for a minute or two on your personal path, since so many of the people watching are young people looking at all the people on this panel and seeing themselves um, in, in who they can become. Just share just a little bit about your path and the ways in which you were able to pioneer to get to your position where you are, which is one of great influence. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, I'm probably not a great role model because I didn't know what I was doing, right? Did anybody know what a community college was when I was starting out in the 70s? I don't think so. And so the cool thing was, I was a Navy wife and we got stationed in Jacksonville, Florida and I was looking for a job and the school system would not hire Navy wives at that time. So I went to the community college to open their door and I started teaching on the base, um, then became a dean uh, and then a provost, then a president. I built a big program, the biggest um, um, online program. We had 45,000 students that were registered when I left Jacksonville. Wow. And so we took that, that initial one course in 1995 and built it into uh, a, a really great and robust way of primarily serving uh, military, mostly Navy. And so I had that opportunity uh, to do. So I retired in uh, Jacksonville and moved on purpose to the only place I've ever per lived on purpose was um, 
uh, here in uh, Salisbury, Kannapolis, Concord area of North Carolina. And um, so that was a purposeful change. The rest of it was evolutionary. I always thought I'd leave the community college, but it was always exciting. It was always changing. It was, a, I never thought about it as a great career. It was a great career. And I think it would be for other people too. Think about that where you can make the most difference in most people's lives, where you can marshal these risk, these huge um, numbers of students. We have 22,000 students I can affect. Where can I do that? Um, so I'm very, very pleased to, to have had the career I have and to be able to share what I know now. And I've had uh, at least one of my staff become a president, another woman who grew up in community colleges. So we are now, and I've got three more on the way. So we're just hatching presidents, I think, at my institution. And I think that's the way uh, that I'll be spending a lot of my time going forward. Yeah. Well, and hopefully your retirement date is nowhere near in the future. So, because we need you. Thank, you. Thank you, Carol. And now it's my pleasure to introduce um, Ekaterina Lashkarov, who's from the Russian Federation. She's official delegate to World Skills and World Skills Europe. So she's going to share more of the global view on the topic of education, employment, entrepreneurship, and equity. Ekaterina. Thank you, Kara. Thank you, Pavel, dear colleagues. Uh, it's a big honor for me to be here today with you. So um, myself, personally, I joined the World Skills uh, Board last August. Uh, but for this moment, so I became the second female within the board and the first uh, representative of the board uh, from Russia. And, uh, but before that, I worked for seven years within the World Skills community. And before that, I worked mostly for the universities and different non-for-profit organizations within the educational field. We've done a lot of projects with the Pavel research projects, community projects with all kind of the big aim of the educational development and helping to build a sustainable educational ecosystem. And uh, well, when I come to the world skills, what inspired me about this movement is that the, the movement itself was created in 1946 after second world war in Europe. So in 1950, the first international competition happened between Spain and Portugal. And back then, the world skills was kind of the answer to the crisis, to the Europe, which was lacking of the skilled uh, workers and uh, skilled professionals. And there was like uh, this need to promote this kind of practical skills approach for youth and for practitioners. And uh, now, um, uh, several decades passed and now we have more than 84 members. So recently Kenya became our 84th member. So now we are talking about the dozens of countries of million and million young people. And uh, now we are on the like pretty critical crisis situation globally again. And within the world skills, we are trying to like contribute with our part to solving this crisis. Again, bringing attention to the skilled workers. We started several campaigns with the uh, uh, hashtag skills keep moving and the essential workers. Because right now we're like a lot of us were or still on isolation. This is actually like the skilled workers who are keeping the world moving. Because you know, like if something suddenly broken in your house or you go to the shop and you still expect to find the fresh bread there. So somebody need to bake it for you. Uh, and uh, in this time, this is especially when crucial to understand how uh, important the like the skilled professional way is. And but within the world skills, as we started as a movement for kind of promote the importance of the blue collar jobs and skilled workers. Now it's much bigger movement, and it's a story about the practical skills and practitioners and. Uh, also, the that's such practical skills and that can be a good choice for the young professionals. And uh, what we like usually want to remind within the world skill that skills have no race or gender. 
and uh, like even more in world skills we never even ask for a diploma for our champions because in world skills you know like sometimes we use this like internal analogy of the like olympic games for skills because usually it it actually looks the same because we are yes we are about the competition but it's also much more about the cooperation and community and when you are if in world skills you're able to demonstrate your practical skills and that you're good in this you were got, uh, gonna get your medal of excellence your appreciations and we would never even ask for a diploma because your like background absolutely doesn't matter if you are a good professional and um, uh, what's also important and this is a big piece of our work joint work with the Pavel it's the whole piece of which we call the future skills because as an educators I believe we have the huge responsibility for the uh, young generation to not only think and like show and demonstrate the world of skills and education and labor opportunities which exist right now but to always always reflect and uh, discuss and promote of how the future of labor and education can look like because the youngsters who are let's say 15 or 20 like years now they're actually going to be in their professional pride in the 2030 2035 so what we know so we need to prepare them basically for the labor market and economy which do not exist yet but uh we but i th we believe that this is our responsibility to work uh, as a community to work with our global industrial partners to work with an international organization with non-for-profit organization with experts globally to understand how the current trends and not only i'm speaking not only what jennifer said about the industry 4.0 for instance robotization automation net centric society like everything that's happening right now all types of the social trends and challenges but how it's actually going to influence the economy and the labor market and try to do absolutely our best to explore how like we can better prepare young people to be successful to be accomplished in this like future labor market uh so we made a few projects um in the previous years, we started some really fascinating foresight projects with Pavel recently. So we are hoping that we're going to be able to share some of the preliminary results of the skills in the COVID and post-COVID world in, I think, this autumn. Uh, so really looking forward for this. And probably yeah, the final thing that I want to say that within the world skills, we discovered that Yes, World Skills is a global hub for the skills excellent, and usually the top of the pyramid, which everybody can see, it's a global competition uh, within the different bunch of skills. Uh, for instance, in Kazan, in the global World Skills competition, we have uh, 250,000 visitors from and competitors like from so many countries. So everybody can see the competition, but actually the basement of this pyramid is the work of community and it's not about competition but it's about collaboration and the work together and this is probably would be like my main message so only working collaboratively we can actually do like step by step this this move forward thank you carol thank you so much and now uh, we're going to go to some perspective from India with SS Sharith. Welcome. And we're looking forward to learning about um, your GEMS organization. And he is also the director of the World University Consortium, which is part of the World Academy of Art and Science. So it'd be great, SS, if you could share on both of those fronts. Oh, you just need to, there you go. Now we can hear you. Sure, Carol, thank you very much for introducing. And I have a different story to tell to all together, actually. As a person associated with academics and education for the last 20 years, I was asking a question to myself and others that why should we educate? Or what is the purpose of education? I cycled myself with some satisfactory answers that it is for creating a value-based society, 
for creating success in human life in a very disciplined way or to lead a harmonious coexistence with all organisms in this ecosystem. That may seem too general or sometimes a philosophical answer, but if we agree on that broad perspective about the purpose of education, we have to also agree on another fact that there is huge mismatch exists between prevailing educational systems and what companies, organizations, or society at large are really in need for. There are some educational institutions which are definitely exceptions, but this mismatch world over is a reality. This I am telling from my own experience in running the largest logistics and supply chain management institution in India, training around 500 plus students every year. I was in the notion at the time of inception of uh, Global Institute of Integral Management Studies, that is my institution, that if I recruit some industry experts with academic flair in the field of logistics as faculties in our institution, it will serve the purpose. After two years of establishment, my story starts. After two years of establishment of this institution, my notion proved to be false when I got a call from a leading freight forwarding company. In the call, the concerned person questioned us that, Srijit, what kind of freshers you are sending us to? They had recruited 20 odd freshers through a campus drive and none of them remained with them. Some of them even switched to other companies for just an increase of $100. Your students lack value. Some of them don't even know the basics of logistics or even the fundamentals of professionalism, so on and so forth. When I look back to their class scores and overall credentials, I found that most of them got above 80% in all their subjects. When these complaints got repeated with few other companies as well, and when a couple of them denied any more campus drives for my institute, I really understood the seriousness of the situation. This has to be addressed and sorted out with immediate effect. We, some 25 faculty members, sat for three full days. We got the help and guidance of uh, uh, Dr. Gary Jacobs, the then CEO and the current president of uh, World Academy of Arts and Science. We assessed the whole situation. We understood clearly that you know, companies are not looking for researchers or scientists as their executives and managers but they need freshers who can learn continuously. Society is dynamically changing. Yesterday's knowledge become obsolete today. Technology also changes very rapidly. They need freshers who can communicate well, who are experts in MS office and bit techno savvy. They also need the youngsters with critical thinking, who can think out of the box, who can stand with the company in contingencies, in creating customer delight. They need people who are dedicated and are value-based, punctual, coordinative, and cooperative. They are in search of right talents for running their firms. They need innovative and creative people who are cheerful and fresh. The question here is, are we developing talents like that? Or simply making them mug up certain age-old answers and the theoretical concepts for writing examinations? Are we preparing them for life? Are we preparing them to meet an uncertain future like this? Now what society requires? Society's expectations from education institution is to create dynamic and young business leaders who can build organization, create new jobs, contribute significantly in regional and national development. We have, a very, we have very well understood now that what we follow as a national curriculum will not help us in this, if our purpose is helping companies and society with the right talents. We decided to revamp the total syllabus and curriculum and adopt a new pedagogy called student-centered approach. We also understood the fact that so much of attention and importance are, we are given every year to syllabus and teachers but very less to students and their personality. First thing we did was changing the focus from memorizing to understanding. 
In the field of logistics, we identified 2,000 concepts and terminologies, which every logistician should know, and developed 200 stories and business cases with which we can explain these 2,000 concepts. We made stories out of everything. Connected football with logistics, floods with logistics, Christmas and mountaineering with logistics. We also explained automobile and pharmaceutical industry in logistical point of view. Next thing we did was creating active participatory sessions in classes through developing various discussion forums. Teachers speak only for 15 to 25 percentage of the sessions. Videos and stories are incorporated where students take the lead role, making it more student-centered than teacher-centered. Teachers play the role of facilitating a session. Teachers only teach students how to learn by themselves. We also made changes from classroom learnings to experiential learning by incorporating small and big projects. For instance, in 2000, um, SS, you just cut off right there, but we're we're um, we're almost at time. So if you want to wrap that up, we're going to go next to Yannick uh, Dupont and his work with Spark. So maybe just maybe just kind of close with one sentence, and then we can. Um, go to Yannick, and then we're going to get into some questions from folks as well. And you can put whatever you want in the chat additionally. Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. And these changes uh, brought some marvelous results actually for us. First one is we had become the largest logistics and supply chain management institution in India. Life is getting recreated in classrooms, making us a student centered campus. Many HR recruitments in recent years is without interviews as former students exhibit high values and integrity. Active participatory sessions also happens. I mean to say smaller changes in our classrooms can create enormous results. Our specifics in each point of discussion in our classroom is very important. Our attention in specifics got the capability of building a student, a citizen, a nation or a better world to put it all. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. And now um, we're delighted to go to our, our um, final panelist and then we're gonna go to some questions. But um, this is Yannick Dupont and he runs Spark, has a very interesting background. And Yannick, I hope that you will be able to share a little bit more about your background, how you got to Spark, um, some of the things that are some of your personal story that led up to this as well. So welcome. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, great to join this wonderful panel. Um, yeah, Spark, we actually work in conflict-affected states. So at the moment, um, I'm actually dialing in from Istanbul, from Turkey, where we have a large response here across the Middle East and all the countries affected by the Syria crisis in getting soon 10,000 young Syrian refugees into local universities to study here. Um, but we work also in other places like Afghanistan, Burundi, Somalia, let's say all the fun places. Um, and if that's not difficult enough, we primarily focus on the underprivileged. So each country has its minorities. Um, each country has issues with women participation. Um, and particularly the countries we, we work in have a lot of issues with internally displaced and refugee populations. Um, yeah, so we focus on these very difficult places and on the underprivileged in those locations at the same time. Um, that has a, a bit of an uphill, uphill battle sometimes, um, but um, therefore very important work. Um, now, of course, in doing so, maybe just to make the link to the topic of today, um, we focus both on getting these kids into higher vocational and university education. So, for example, maybe um, some groups in the Netherlands are underrepresented at university, but for example, figure this, only 1% of refugees actually that would normally enroll in university does so because of their situation. So they're extremely underprivileged. Um, so we tried to up that number and in the Middle East, I think we, put, we pushed the needle from one to a couple of percentage points by that scholarship program that we've launched uh, with great help from both the Gulf and Western states. 
Um, but at the same time, traditionally we focus um, our efforts on getting these kids post-graduation into relevant uh, work. Um, so we have a lot of work on going on entrepreneurship, working primarily with business leaders, with SMEs, with uh, multilateral, sorry, multinational corporations in these countries, in try to project and work from the beginning how these kids can make it from education to the labor market. Um, so there, I think that wouldn't come as, as a surprise to uh, for the speakers before me. We focus primarily on first speaking to the private sector, first speaking to the industry, um, before we even start planning scholarships to find out what are the relevant fields that these kids can work in, what skill sets do they need, and then work with the industry and the education institutions to make sure we select the right study programs and improve these while we enroll these kids. Um, now, because of COVID, and you referenced that at the beginning, I think there is um, some very unique challenges that we are now facing. I think, first of all, most of the universities that we have the 10,000 kids in are now closed. Uh, only a few of them are moved online, and those are primarily private higher education institutions. That's, again, a problem because these are mostly inhabited by, of course, the privileged and not the underprivileged. Um, only the ones that we can provide a scholarship for get to enroll there. So I think the COVID situation, if we don't watch out, will actually um, yeah, push the needle back um, and push them again back into their vulnerable situation. Um, with SMEs, we found that 85% in a recent survey we did with Rent Corporation here in the region, 85% of the SMEs we're supporting and young entrepreneurs are afraid they won't make it to the new year with the current uh, economic collapse here in the region. Uh, and again, of course, in states like the Netherlands or the US, the crisis is severe. Uh, but if in Lebanon right now, the currency has lost, I think, 70% of its value. So imagine you just, you just lost 70% of your pension fund, 70% of your salary, and your purchasing power, and it's still in a free fall. Um, so, yeah, so we are experiencing some very big difficulties here. Um, on the other hand, and maybe that's on an upbeat tone. I think there's some really great opportunities right now due to COVID. Um, we're seeing now that some public uh, universities are moving online really fast. So we're reprogramming our work and trying to help them to get online. It is a constant battle to find best practice institutions from the West. Maybe someone of you on the panel actually could be, uh, we could be partnering with. to try to help these universities to move online really fast. And, not just tech, with technical support, we can provide that computers, servers, software, all of that we have funds for, but it's more about the knowledge and how to train the professors to make that switch and how to really make an online course and not just put your PowerPoint online. Um, the other thing um, that we really see as a, as a massive opportunity, but also a challenge, is get these kids in the world of online work. So we see a lot of entrepreneurs moving to IT companies, but also graduates trying to see how they can still sell their skill sets online. Um, and there, yeah, we have a, we have a huge challenge. We have 10,000 kids now in uh, university. They're going to graduate all within the next two to three years. So at this moment, our big challenge, and also I need to get some ideas from the participants and from other panelists, is how do we get them into meaningful jobs, not just in this region, but also perhaps online um, through the coding schools we're working with here in the region go some way, but we need more ideas, how to get them into the world of online work. So that's just maybe as a first pitch. That's incredible. And if you could please put in the um, chat area, people are asking questions about how they can get involved with Sparks. And so if you can, any of you put your information into the um, chat field so that the viewers can follow up and get involved in ways that make sense for them. And Pavel is going to um, look at some other additional questions, and then we're going to go to one to two minute wrap for each of you. Pavel? Yes. Uh, well, I, first of all, really appreciate the fantastic contribution made by each panelist. I think we have such a huge variety of situations that uh, all are working in the service of uh, greater employability, endorsing young people entrepreneurship and um, a young people agency and uh, increasing opportunities for uh, underprivileged groups for groups in uh, regions that are largely unprivileged by uh, by the history or by culture whatever was the historical trajectory so facing all that 
uh, I wanted to ask each of you, uh, because we are also holding this panel in the context of a project called Global Leadership for 21st Century, where together with United Nations Office at Geneva, we are seeking some of the practical solutions for the world and from you as leaders that can bring these solutions. So I would like each of you to give your suggestions. What do you think could be some of those critical interventions that can improve employability opportunities that can improve entrepreneurial capabilities of young people and that can improve equity for the world. So uh, we, we will be happy with one or two minute contributions. And maybe Carol, I would like to invite you maybe to sure. also to speak up. What, what is your experience? I'll, what is your I'll perspective? kick it off. Yeah, I'm happy to, um, to share. I think there's two critical things. One is that COVID and a lot of the racial tension, the things that are going on around the world, um, we've also seen that people are food insecure, technology insecure, housing insecure, and people can't learn if they're not healthy and people cannot work if they're not healthy. So what is a systems integrated approach where we're looking at all of those different aspects and being able to solve in a systems way for people who need multiple measures to be able to move forward and to get themselves, I like to say, to financial freedom. So that's one thing. The second thing is that there are a lot of people around the world who are in positions of wealth and power and can be really a part of funding the kinds of things like when Jennifer talks about the bold goal or a lot of other major lever moving initiatives. But I think sometimes a lot of the money gets stuck because we don't have diverse people at the table or sometimes diverse people on the boards to communicate where some of the on the ground needs actually exist. And that's where I think it's very exciting to work with you all and Gary's whole network of global scientists and leaders because they're very much connected to those people at all the different universities and through the Nobel prizes they've won and all kinds of things, but we need a much bigger web and we need the capital to really start moving in the direction where the change makers, the young people, the people under 20 or, you know, people who are like those of us on this call can really mobilize systems uh, outcomes that are measurable but we need to be given the funding from um, people who typically would see these things as more risky because it's not people they all know. Those would be my, those would be my couple. Wonderful, and I just maybe, I'm also curious because when you say that health is, is I absolutely agree, health is a condition of many other, a prerequisite of many other things that people, uh, enable people to do things. Do you think that requires also maybe some reorganizing of curriculum, like base, uh, basic school curriculum? Because uh, maintaining your health is also a skill in a way. Yes, absolutely. And I think what we know is that the least resourced people around the world are eating the worst kinds of food. And they live in food deserts and they eat fast food. And all these things are related. So absolutely, the more people can grow up learning about that, the better, and then I think the one percent of the, you know, world's educated at the all the private schools around the world. Those are people that need to take big responsibility for connecting to all of these other people at a time like this. So we don't kind of continue that um, one percentism, is what I call it. Mm -hmm. So maybe we should just go in the order of the panel presenters and. Uh, can you please also make your suggestions on what are those critical interventions required? We'll start with Kevin. Is that okay, Kevin? Yes. Make sure we got Kevin still here. Oh, I'm, I'm still here. Okay, so okay, good. <laughs> I, I think as, 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 as Carol and Pavel said, said um, when, when, you, when you look at the, the problems of, of the world, and, and my focus is, is, is often STEM, uh, we, we live in a world that's, that's, uh, that's codependent and uh, probably uh, is severable, inseparable, right? And so um, where there's inequality in one place, is, 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 you know, it's, it's everywhere, right? And so 
it just being in our neighborhood is and fixing that problem is 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 not a solution uh, that that is sustainable, and and so for me, one of the biggest issues is 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 trying to get people invested, and we're not just talking about uh, fiscal or financial investment, but investment of their minds and and and, and their hands and 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 being a part of the whole process of of, of helping people be ready in this environment to be able to, to, to have their needs met in this environment and to be able to contribute in this environment. And so we have experts, we have expertise on this panel. We, on this panel, know um, organizations that are doing great things, um, but we have to find ways to get people invested, uh, people that have the right skills to, to get in, invested so that we can bring both the people who are in need and the people, uh, Carol, you call them the one percenters, um, get those together so that we can find resonance. Because I believe that we are at a time where, where people that, that, that have the best educations and the best opportunities are now seeing that we can't live in this world as it is. And so the opportunities are there. Investment from people like you and me and, and, and others is, is what will bring us together. Thank you, Kevin. That's why I always say, if it's not good for everyone's children, it's not going to be good for your children. <laughs> That's how interdependent the world is now. So, um, Jennifer, let's go to you next, and then Jessica. Yeah, I think it's all about um, engaging our youth and getting them involved in all areas of what's going to impact them. So, one thing we're doing right now is um, bringing youth entrepreneurs in and helping them and changing the system of how youth can actually own and start their own businesses. You see things differently. I had conversations the last two weeks with youth about social media and the impact of social media on their mental well-being, their health, how they feel about it, what could AI do to assist them, um, what are the types of systems to change that. And instead of us just as adults and, and folks in the workforce or education or government having those discussions, actually listening and bringing the youth into these conversations to help architect the solutions, I think is imperative. We've got to involve them and not only involve them, but listen, like actually listen to what their suggestions and solutions are. I think it's imperative that they're in these conversations and, and not only in them, but have a role in the conversations. So that is a call I think we can all make in all areas to engage a more diverse population of folks in the conversations, including ages, you know, different ages of individuals. And then the second thing, as you mentioned, Carol, is we want to, there's been a lot of money spent on diversity and inclusion. I think you've quoted the stats of how much companies collectively have spent, but then has the impact matched the spend and are we spending it in the right ways? So I think leveraging funding in appropriate ways where it has impact on things like the bold goal that Global Minded mm -hmm. is focused on with other organizations. Like let's hold people accountable that the investment equals impact. I mean, from a funding perspective, um, we mentioned, um, Dr. Brown mentioned that one to 3% of funding goes to um, people of color or women for venture capital. If we don't change that system, you don't get a different result. Like. There are stats that actually prove when you fund diverse founders, when you fund these people, they actually return a higher return on your investment. They return more for every dollar invested. So the fact that we're not actually changing that, even though the stats support, if you fund diverse people, you get a better outcome. There's higher innovation, all types of benefits. But how do we fix that? So I think I gave you three, actually, I cheated, but I would like all three to be resolved. Engaging youth, funding in the right ways and act diversity and inclusion spending, which actually matches doing those things for an investment that makes sense for the world and moves the needle. Here, here. Jessica, you're up. A fact to follow from Dr. Brown and, <laughs> and Jennifer. Um, I, I, I actually, I wanna again, thank the panel and thank everyone here today because I think you, both of you just recently um, queued me up for, for something that I wanted to share with you guys. And I wanted, um, maybe earlier, some of you in the audience saw that I teased the panel by saying that I was gonna invite them um, to something today. And I started to share that in the chat already. Um, 
I think you're absolutely right. Everyone on this panel is definitely on the right path, right, to figuring this out together. Uh, Dr. Brown, you said it so well, and it was like one of your first statements. You said we need to we need to build better communities. We need to build community. So many people, even though we are home, still might feel like they're lacking in community, even though we have access to being anywhere in the world at any time, globally, virtually. We're still lacking community. And then this other thing that got compromised with COVID um, and also everything in the world going on because if you are thinking about protesting how could you focus on this like work assignment that is happening if you're thinking about people that are dying unjustly how could you focus on on your work so education's also begun to get compromised and both of you are speaking right to it and so i'll just go straight to it um i believe we need to design for community-based education i believe that we can get education from many places and we can find community in weird deep web places <laughs> for sure there's no doubt about that but i think a community from which you are open to learning with not just from but with which means that there's an exchange which means that there's two-way transactions if you can imagine when we you know classrooms look very different in many parts of the world and with virtual even more but the power of a book club is such a simple simple thing um, I was never introduced to a book club growing up. I, you know, even though my mom told me to read a lot, that there wasn't a culture around that. But we have to take action in building the culture and building the communities that we want to see. Otherwise, um, a whole year is going to pass. Google is already working remotely until the end of summer 2021, officially, right? So a whole year is going to pass, and we're still not going to have educated ourselves intentionally from a place of community, right? Um, you know, this, this week is the, from the 13th to the 19th, we're honoring um, Juneteenth, right? And we're trying to get Juneteenth to be a wonderful, um, as it should be, national holiday. And actually, I'll do it right now. I'll put this link here so you all can go to this page, which is helping you help your companies around you honor and uh, acknowledge Juneteenth, just the way that Twitter made it a holiday and stuff like this. So um, I want to wrap by saying that I think what we need right now is to go inwards. Now that we're locked up inside is the perfect opportunity to go inside ourselves and figure out our own purposes, but also how we tick, what makes us tick and what makes us feel fulfilled. Personally, when I'm contributing and helping others help themselves, that brings me a lot of joy and fulfillment and satisfaction. So on Juneteenth, my company, Dorothy Design, a very small business, a very minority owned, refugee powered, all of these wonderful taglines because F it, no one else is doing it. We're gonna start a book club. It's gonna be a little bit of a different kind of book club. We're definitely dancing before we start reading every session, but you know, here it goes. This guy they did this for us, Kobe Bryant, right before he passed. Uh -huh he published this book. And I don't think you can imagine a more friendly, fun, it's so colorful, the pages, book for black and brown and all colorful kinds of kids right now. Um, and it's actually a really good read, like my adult friends really like it. So, so what, if, what, what could a book club look like right now? What, what could it look like to be leaders of small children <laughs> that we can influence and learn from, right? That we can begin to have conversations around agency, like. I want to read this book with you. I want to do, and it's not just going to be reading book. It's going to be like writing their own book of visualizations. And there's, there's this whole educational component to it. Um, so the invitation is going to be that uh, our panelists, and I'll say this on, on the main stage, our panelists will be receiving an email this week from us with some sketches of these ideas. And maybe, um, and the invitation will be to, to, to gnaw on that for a little bit and see how maybe um, all of our organizations coming together can find a nice little common thread and, and maybe this is a thing. Maybe people are reading books together in, in community again. So, thank you. Fabulous, thank you so much. Dr. Spaulding. Okay, You're on mute, Dr. Spaulding. <laughs> Um, thank you. Sorry. Okay, so I thank you for the book club thing. I think it's really great. Um, the critical intervention for me is, um, is trying to raise the educational expectations for our communities. We have resources. We have opportunities. Sometimes they're not followed through, either because people don't feel like they can afford it 
or their own groups are holding them back. And so raising those expectations, I think, are something that we have to do in, this, in the region. I'll just give you a case in point. Charlotte has been a really, um, just a, a giant uh, in North Carolina, growing to be the largest um, urban center. Uh, but it just got awarded the, this is not a really great award, it's a terrible award, as the least likely for upward mobility in the country for large metropolitan areas. That really hurt their feelings. It really got their attention. It really got the money flowing. Um, and so I think just the metrics of some of these things can be something that can help people see that what they're doing uh, could be improved. So that raising these expectations, they may not even know where they are on some of these scales. And so I think changing the, you know, doing some benchmarking, giving some, uh, some criteria out there for what's really good and what's not is, is, would be very helpful. Um, the other piece of this changing the educational expectations has to do with uh, my career really, where community college is always seen as the second choice, uh, as the backup school, as the you know, less than, and in fact, it's more than. Um, and so I think changing that expectation is really important, especially for moving people into the middle class, because you can go there all different kinds of routes. You don't have to go by transferring to a four-year university. And then I want to do a shout out for our Skills USA to the World U Skills, because we have the, uh, the best female, but the best person, masonry uh, person in the country. We won uh, top school awards for that. So. Um, we look forward to having more of this celebration of these skills, especially when you've got um, people who you wouldn't expect to be in them, and she'll be running a company uh, very, very soon. Thank you so much, Carol. And I will say, I just think that the community colleges and colleges that don't cost much around the world are just going to explode in ways that they never have. That's my prediction, but we'll see what happens. You're right. So wonderful. Ekaterina, and then we'll, uh, we see Gary on here, so we'd like to get his input too. Ekaterina, go ahead. Well, yeah, basically, I just want to continue what Carol just said, but uh, like I think when we are talking about the diversity and inclusion, we <clears throat> already said that I personally believe that skills don't have gender or race, but also diversity means that, I mean, life is big and complicated and we need to like support different choices in career. And, and uh, we need to stop the stigmatization of people who do not uh, go to the universities directly after high school because this is like so little proportion of people globally who is actually privileged to do so. But we are, when we all talking about the lifelong learning, usually sometimes people forget that lifelong learning means that there is this boundaries between your, I don't know, your primary education, your middle school, high school, university, colleges, your additional education, vet education, online education, offline, something that you can learn from different online platform now, your professional experience, your volunteer work, every, actually all of this count and all of this need to be considered and need to, we need to help young people, but only not, not only young people, like be appreciated for the whole their professional journey and now just some like fancy piece of it. And from the like professionals, from the managers, we need to be like able to speed up such process. And uh, and from the like social media PR campaign, I think we need to like continue working in this direction. And as Carol just said, and as I got like the majority of the audience who are listening right now us are from the like um, United States, like yes, locally in like all of our countries, please support non-for-profit organization who are trying to do their job and they're doing their job amazingly. As Carol said, uh, World Skills in the United States called Skills USA and they're doing an amazing job. And if you can just visit their national competition next year in June in Atlanta or World Skills Global competition in Shanghai next year, so you can also like uh, personally see all of this 
amazing talented experts and young people like proving that the skills like really can change lives and skills matters. Thank you. Thank you. And if you can put all that in the chat, then people can can mark, you know, their calendars with that information as well. So thank you. thank you so much. Okay, and SS to you for a minute or two, and then we're going to um, um, go on to Yannick, and then we're going to hear a little bit from uh, Gary as well before we uh, before we wrap up. Hi. Uh, what I would like to recommend is a redesign in the approach to the classrooms, actually. The first is, you know, we have to uh, change the approach of our classrooms from the very first standard itself, you know, memorizing to understanding, passive to active learning process, from a teacher-centered curriculum to a student-centered pedagogy, or uh, classroom learning to experiential learning, and teaching to learning itself, or training employment to entrepreneurship and individual study to peer-to-peer -peer learning. You know, these are some of the methods actually uh, we adopted uh, with the guidance of Gary Jacobs here in our uh, campus and proved to be successful actually. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Yannick, your one to two wrap on the critical interventions needed for the systems change that will really, really start to move things. Yes, thank you. Um, well, many things come to mind, but I think the main thing that comes to mind that we're discussing in our organization is how do we make sure that this whole disruptive moment of COVID and the economic fallout we're going to see that we're seeing already around us is not going to put us back in terms of promoting inclusivity. Um, so we are seeing at the moment that actually the more marginalized are more than proportionally hit uh, at this moment because they're enrolled in education that's not online um, or because they are in economies that are um, less developed and are now you know, completely uh, off track. So I think that's one. I mean, on a positive note, though, I think one thing, and I don't have answers to that, but we have to really think how we can use this disruptive moment um, to reach scale for inclusion. So for example, you know, how can we accelerate digitalization of these excluded communities? Um, for example, work with institutions to provide broader scale and more affordable online education in the communities we work with. Um, and one that I mentioned with, um, with, with particularly refugees and excluded communities, how to get them part of this movement of digitalization um, and the world of online work. Um, because I think if they miss the boat, uh, after no doubt the world is going to accelerate in uh, digitalization terms, um, I think they may fall behind further. On a positive note, if we can bring them on board, I think it may be a leapfrogging moment for many of them. Absolutely, and one of the things is we've got to get a commitment from every single manufacturer of computers that we get these computers out there and that we get brown bad on bad connectivity out to people as well. So thank you. And then Gary, should we go to you and then we can wrap up with uh, Pavel? Well, actually, thank you, Carol, but I just really came to audit the class uh, oh. and, and, and learn something uh, from this great diverse group of people that you and Pavel have put together. And thank you so much for taking the initiative. Uh, uh, I was delayed because I was at the session on full employment. And you can understand that the elephant that was missing in the room was education. Uh, and we all knew that the elephants in the next room, uh, so I was eager to get here. Uh, it was a terrific session though on the idea that we absolutely have to address the employment and livelihood issue and obviously education is the, the key to the whole thing. Uh, I do feel that this is an auspicious opportune time because education is our, maybe our single most precious endowment as human beings that dis distinguishes us from the rest of the animal kingdom is that we are able to learn from the past and experience and pass it on to the next generation so we keep learning and we can keep getting better and better. Uh, and I 
often say that uh, education, we can give it credit for all of the achievements of humanity up until now. It's not te technology itself has come from that. Uh, but if we still have problems, the problems also reflect the fact that we're still learning how to educate ourselves. And there's so much more to be done. And I think one of the advantages of this time is it's forcing us to get out of the box. It's breaking down the barriers of a very traditional, conventional institu social institution, which has been more preoccupied with preserving the past than building the future. And what we really need is out of the box thinking and initiative and innovation to do it. In uh, just, I mentioned in my opening, uh, the inaugural session, that seven years ago, just to last week, we had our a conference at UN Geneva, uh, and uh, we had a session on education, and we asked a question. If you were going to try to design an educational system, affordable, accessible, world-class educational system open to everybody, how would you do it? And there was a dead silence in the room. So we spent the next five years, we started the World University Consortium, we went around and conducted uh, international conferences at UC Berkeley, my alma mater in Mexico, in uh, Brazil, in Rome, uh, uh, and other places. Uh, and I think everybody agreed on only one thing. We wouldn't do it the way we're doing it now. This simply, the system we have, all the research we're putting in and all the dedicated people is simply not designed to get the maximum to everybody. And the, too many of the institutions have too much vested in preserving what they have rather than uh, taking advantage of the technology. You know, it's kind of like when the internet came around, Barnes & Noble was the biggest bookstore in the world, book cup seller in the world. And they were asking, oh, this is great. How do we get more people into our school? And along came Amazon saying, we don't have any schools or stores. We want to know how to get more books to the world's people. And I think that's the kind of question we need to be asking now. So I want to thank you all uh, for your participation. And uh, I hope it's clear from what Pavel said, for us, this is just the beginning of an exploration of alternatives. We want to learn from what you're all doing. We want to partner with you. And we want to come to the conference in October with a real innovative blueprint of how to get it out, get out of the box and get to the work that's waiting for us uh, with hundreds of millions of people who just aren't getting even the minimum of what they need for livelihood in the 21st century. So thank you all. Thank you so much, Gary, and for putting us all together. So it's, it's, we wouldn't be having this today if it wasn't for your, your vision and your realization of how critical this work is at a time like this. So Pavel, you wanna make some closing remarks and then we can um, maybe just have next steps. I think this is a, a really influential group of um, change makers. So, yes, uh, thank you all of you for your contributions and uh, just uh, put the summary into a chat uh, for some of those contributions made during the second round. Um, I wanted, first of all, to emphasize that uh, we are indeed in a very interesting and, and in somewhat a critical moment in uh, at least several decades and it can be seen as a bifurcation point in many regards that as Yannick said there is a possibility that we'll be taken back for on many uh, dimensions but there is also a possibility that we can go forward and I really enjoyed what Jessica was talking about when she said this is a reset button moment in a way we are able right now to press the reset button to reconsider some of the things that have been hold, let's say, held uh, as constants, as, as given for years, and to reconsider them and to start creating a system that would be uh, serving the humanity and it needs in a much better way, let's say. And so in that regard, I uh, would 
echo what Gary just said. We are just at the beginning. This is a process of collective exploration. All of you panelists are invited to join this exploration with us. Uh, there is a, 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 the main opportunities, of course, within the, what World Academy of Art and Science is doing right now with uh, UN in terms of exploring global leadership for 21st century. And uh, the second opportunity was mentioned also by Ekaterina. This is the project that we do together we, we, on, on the behalf of World Skills, uh, an exploration of future skills that would be needed throughout the next decade that can address many of the challenges that have been mentioned today. How to increase opportunities for young kids and literally everyone around the world, given all the transformations we are anticipating. So we hope to see you in those panels. We hope to co continue partnering with you. This is, like it was said, just the beginning of the journey. Thank you, Pavel. And I think there's a really fabulous way that we can knit together the world skills with the bold goal. And we can start with 25 million you know, first gen low income students, and that can be 50 million algorithmically. And there can be multi millions of people who turn out to be like the uh, people that are on this panel, many of whom are from, you know, very humble beginnings. So I think um, that's the power of this group is to knit together the different things so we can have that major impact. So with that, Pavel and I want to thank all of you for being part of this today. And we are delighted this whole week to join World Academy of Art and Science in UN Geneva with all their different sessions that they have. And, and for those of you um, that came through Global Minded, it's all posted on our website. You can sign up for any session there. And um, we've got wonderful sessions tomorrow and the next few days all on what the global leadership looks like in the 21st century. So we hope you'll join us. And if you have a conflict, we'll have these posted to the um, Global Minded YouTube channel. And if you're a teacher, you can watch this virtually with your students. If you're a parent, a business person, this can help um, really uh, raise these issues within your company or a funder, same kind of thing. So we appreciate you being here and uh, look forward to participating with you all for the rest of this week. Thanks so much for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Great to meet you all. Guys, we'll, Pavel and I will be back in touch and we will coordinate things from here. Thanks so much for making time, everybody. Thank you all. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Really inspiring. Thank you, guys. Enjoy. Thank you. Thanks Good so luck. much, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. It's Istanbul, huh, Yannick? I can't hear you. You muted yourself now. Oh, sorry, one second. Yes, Istanbul is home. It used to be Cairo and then with Belgrade before that. So I've been out of Holland for 25 years now. And you're based where? Right now, um, an MIT fraternity. Okay, cool. <laughs> you know, people either love that or are really thrown off by that. <laughs> so it filters it out pretty well. <laughs> That sounds very cool. Sounds very cool. I live in community. I've been really, I, I, I never thought of it this way because I'm supposed to be an engineer doing engineering things. I don't know what that is, but I've always been experimenting with community. And then with COVID-19, I realized like, oh, that's what I've, that's like a central thread through all of this. Like how, how do you bring people together in awkward situations? How, how do you talk to them in awkward situations? How do you help them grow? Yeah. But it's good to have situation. an engineering background. <laughs> No, but I think engineers, I, I see a lot of wonderful, I mean, uh, engineers working in my field of development. I think there's too many social scientists like myself out here. And I think engineers have a very special way of breaking down problems, social problems in the engineering kind of way, and then engineering a solution. So we have a couple of engineers in our team. It's really uh, uh, another way of thinking. Yeah. So I need to run out. It's already late here. Yeah. So you guys are morning. We're like, uh, where's 8.30? <laughs> need to leave my house. Sorry? Seven. Yeah, seven oh. from the East Coast.
Yeah. So cool. Yeah. Well, good to good to meet you, and um, I guess I'll be sending you that email now that I said that out loud. In front of a yes, lot of people. do. No, please do so. And if you're at MIT, actually, I have to check. I think we were. Yeah, we were in conversations there with a group working on like uh, uh, refugee solutions from MIT and online education and. Uh, yeah, so I was actually thinking to visit. I'm quite often, well, not anymore. I'm quite often visiting DC with the World Bank and all. So uh, I was just there before the lockdown, beginning of March. So I should be there later this year. So yeah, do stay in touch. Well, if you come to MIT later this year, it's going to be a little tough. <laughs> but <laughs> um, absolutely, you know, when, when we're feeling good about all of this, you're, you'd be so welcome. Everybody would be so welcome to come by and visit. And yeah, let's see. Let's see. It may also just blow over if they find something. No. No. Right. Well, good talking right. to you, Yannick. Thank you for being here. I'm, I'm sure we'll cross paths again. All right. <laughs>